So here you are, playing Don't Star. Feel like you're doing pretty well and are almost done with your first winter. But then you get curb stomped by a deer clops. Only to res at a touchstone. Get curb stomped again. Res again. Only to die to the cold before finding the stuff to make a fire. Does this sound like you? Hey there, my name is Salandrak, and welcome to my Beginner's Guide series for Don't Starve, the delightful sandbox action-adventure survival game from indie developer Clay Entertainment. This series of videos is intended for anyone who is new to the Don't Starve worlds, coming back from a long hiatus, or otherwise looking to improve their gameplay, particularly if they're having trouble surviving past their first year or so in the game. In today's episode on Getting Started, we'll cover basic survival principles and game mechanics and go over what you need to know and do to get started on the right foot during the first 5-10 to 10 days of any new world. Although I'll be playing in the Reign of Giants DLC, the principles explained here will also apply to Vanilla Don't Starve and Don't Starve Together, but will only apply to a lesser extent to Shipwrecked and Hamlet, which I'll cover in later videos. Do note that depending on which version you're playing on, some of the recipes may be different and some of the items may or may not be available in the version you are using. Before we get started in a new world, I want to talk briefly about mods, game settings, and character selection. As with many modern games, the Don't Starve franchise has an active modding community that has put together offerings ranging from simple quality of life and informational mods all the way to complete overhauls of the game and its mechanics. The only mods I personally use are a minimap mod and the combined status mod. The minimap mod does just what it sounds like, adds an on-screen minimap which is extremely useful for navigation and exploration so you don't have to toggle back and forth through the full screen map all the time. The combined status mod adds a ton of useful information to the UI, including numeric values for your character's stats, season and moon trackers, player and environment temperatures, and even your naughtiness level. Game settings are accessed by clicking the world button on the new game screen. The default settings are pretty good for learning the game, though there is one setting I strongly recommend changing if you're a beginner, and that is the starting season. By default, the game randomly chooses either spring or autumn, but between the two, autumn is much easier for new players, for a couple of reasons. First, the weather is much friendlier in autumn as the days are long, the nights are pleasant, and rain is infrequent and short. By contrast, spring has lots of rain, that will make warmth and sanity difficult to maintain. More importantly, as between the following seasons of summer and winter, summer is much harder for new players than winter, particularly if summer is your second season in a new world. By contrast, winter as a second season isn't too bad, and summer as your fourth season means you'll be that much more prepared for the summer heat. Finally, a few words about characters. When you first start playing Don't Starve, the only characters you'll have available are Wilson and Wagstaff. Most other characters are unlocked through in-game experience, which is tallied up each time a character reaches their ultimate demise, or when you enter a new chapter of Adventure Mode beyond the first one. Other characters are unlocked by performing certain in-game actions, such as burying a spider skull to unlock Weber. For your first couple of worlds, hands down, the best option is to simply pick Wilson. He has no particular weaknesses, has decent character stats and combat strength, and grows a magnificent beard that will help keep you warm during the winter and provide the otherwise somewhat elusive beard hair crafting material when he shaves. Once you've gotten the basics of the game under your belt, it can be a lot of fun playing as the other characters, as their varying strengths and weaknesses really enhance the gameplay experience and provide a ton of replayability for your ongoing journeys in this dangerous world. And with all that preliminary stuff out of the way, let's go ahead and start a new game. Welcome to the Constant! After a brief greeting from Maxwell, the antagonist of Single Player Don't Starve, it's time to get to work. We'll go ahead and fast forward Wilson in the background while he chases some butterflies and demonstrates the first things you'll want to do in a new world, namely, Explore your immediate surroundings, particularly any nearby green grasslands, and gather basic supplies, including grass, twigs, any flint you see lying around, and any food you can forage such as berries, carrots, and seeds. In the meantime, let's take a couple of minutes to talk about a few important survival principles you'll need to always remember throughout your journeys and don't starve. The first is simply the old Boy Scout motto of Be Prepared. There are lots of dangers you will come across in your adventures, some of which can be avoided, while others will be forced upon you. In order to survive these dangers, it is critical to always be prepared for them by carrying around critical survival materials, seasonal clothing and items, weapons and armor, and maintaining a supply chain of food to keep yourself fed. 
We'll go over each of these topics a bit later. The second survival principle, well known to anyone who has ever read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is this. Don't panic. If you find yourself in a sticky situation, which will happen, it's a good idea to pause the game, think about what you need to do, formulate a plan, and then do your best to make it through. There are a lot of little mistakes that might cost you your life, like starting a fight with low durability weapons or armor, not noticing you're out of grass when the night is approaching and hounds are baying, or even being close to a pig village on the full moon. Staying cool, calm, and collected will help minimize the risk of making a fatal error. And while we're on the topic of fatal errors, here's some of the ways you can easily get yourself killed if you either don't know what you're doing or are just being a bit careless. Picking a fight with a herd of beefalo. Not letting sleeping dogs lie. It's a trap! Fighting spiders on their nest. Being careless around tentacles. Getting too close to interpersonal disputes between the locals. And trying to get your stuff back after you've already failed to run the tall bird gauntlet. These unfortunate deaths raise our final survival principle, which, if it had been followed, would have prevented all of these fatalities. Coming to us courtesy of King Arthur from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, it is simply this. Whenever a danger you're not prepared for rears its ugly head, you should... There are lots of fights you can escape from simply by running away, and as the old adage goes, he that fights and runs away may live to fight another day. Most mobs in Don't Starve have a limited aggro radius or can be distracted by other creatures in the area, giving you time to make a hasty retreat. Rather than getting yourself killed with bravery, it may be better to fall back, resupply, or gather allies, and then go back to face the foe. Getting back to our Wilson, you can see he's already gathered a decent number of items, so let's discuss in greater detail the first element of Be Prepared, Critical Survival Materials, which consists of cut grass, twigs, logs, and flint. I call these Critical Survival Materials because so long as you stay well stocked with these items, you'll be able to survive pretty much anything the game might throw at you. Run out of one of these items and your survival chances will go down quite a bit. Run out of two or more of these items, you'll most likely find yourself dead within a day or two. Crafting various combinations of these items allows you to make an enormous number of tools, weapons, clothing, survival items, structures, and more that you will need throughout your adventures. In the early game, you'll need them to make torches and campfires to survive the nighttime, axes and pickaxes so you can harvest trees and boulders, and once you've built a science station, you'll need them to make a backpack, a spear, and some log armor. Try to get at least 20 each of grass and twigs as soon as possible, and once you've found some flint, go ahead and make an axe to start cutting down trees to get some logs. Note that evergreen and birch nut trees come in different sizes, and it's usually best to chop down the biggest versions in order to get maximum secondary drops such as pine cones and birch nut seeds. I personally like to keep my critical survival materials on the right hand side of my main inventory hotbar. That way I can quickly check my quantities while keeping the left side free for equipable items that can quickly be toggled using hotkeys. As you go throughout the game, it's a good idea to never leave base with less than 20 each of grass and twigs, a full stack of 20 logs, and at least 10 flint. It's also a good idea to have full stacks of each stored at your base, and once you're a bit more established, you'll want to place a chest with at least 10 of each at every touchstone you found. We haven't talked about these yet, but in brief, touchstones are structures, two of which are randomly placed in each world. Each one that you've touched will allow you to res a single time should you die. Placing some critical survival materials near each touchstone will help ensure that if and when you do res up one, you won't just die again before you can get back to your base. It's also a really good idea to store an umbrella and a winter hat at each touchstone in order to increase your survival chances during the other seasons. Which brings us back to the second element from our Be Prepared graphic from earlier, Seasonal Survival Gear. You really don't have to worry about the weather during the fall, as even the occasional rainstorm won't last long enough to cause any problems. But in future seasons, failure to prepare for the changing weather will result in death. We'll cover these more in later videos dealing with the different seasons, but for now just know that in winter you'll need gear to keep yourself warm, such as a winter hat or puffy vest. In spring you'll need items to keep yourself dry, such as an umbrella or raincoat. And in summer you'll need a way to keep cool, such as an ice cube or floral shirt. As for our Wilson, let's check in on him. He's early into his second day, is off to a great start gathering his critical survival materials, and has been very fortunate to have found some gold already. 
Once you've found at least 5 gold, 16 stone, and can get additional wood as needed, it's a good idea to go ahead and make your first crafting station, the Science Machine. When you stand next to it, you'll be able to prototype new items and add them to your character's repertoire. Thereafter, you'll be able to make them anywhere in the world as long as you have the materials on hand. Great candidates to make right away are a shovel so you can start digging up tree stumps, a backpack to increase your carrying capacity, and rope so you can make a spear and the log suit armor. Before you move away, you'll also want to learn boards, cut stone, electrical doodads, and then pre-build an alchemy engine. Pre-building is an important trick you'll want to be aware of that you'll want to take advantage of fairly often. After you click to craft a placeable structure, you can right-click to cancel the placement. It will remain in limbo in its crafted state just waiting to be placed at any time in the future. In this case, Wilson won't want to stick around at this location, so having learned everything he needs to know for the time being, he'll take his pre-crafted alchemy engine with him and continue his exploration. Once he's found a suitable location for a long-term base, he'll be able to immediately drop the alchemy engine without having to carry around all the materials in his inventory. Win-win! We'll let Wilson keep doing his thing in the background while we talk about our last two elements of Be Prepared, starting with weapons and armor. Wilson here has already demonstrated how early you can make a spear and log armor, which, absent finding something lying on the ground, is the first protection you'll have access to. So follow his example and make them as soon as you've got enough materials to craft all the things we just talked about. And if at all possible, be sure to do so before the dawn of day 7, as that's about when you might have your first periodic hound attack, which typically happens sometime during your second week. The details of hound attacks and how to deal with them is a topic for another video, but for now just know that the first attack isn't too bad, especially if you already have a spear and some armor. There will only be two hounds this first round, and they're really easy to handle even if you aren't very good at combat yet. Here's an example of a first attack. When the first hound comes in, let him get close, then as he goes into his attack animation, step away quickly. The attack will miss, and then you can return to start whacking with your spear. Go ahead and just tank the second attack, and after five hits the hound will be dead, usually before his buddy arrives. Rinse and repeat for the second hound. Yes, there are other ways to deal with and even fight the hounds without taking any damage, but that will be covered more in later videos covering combat in general and hound attacks in particular. And finally, no beginner's guide to Don't Starve would be complete without telling you how to, well, not starve. In the early game, you won't have access to technological wonders like crockpots, drying racks, or ice boxes, so you're going to be limited to what you can find or easily hunt and cook over a campfire. I'll go over all the details about staying well fed in a later video, but for now here are some general principles to get you started. First, cook your food before eating. Most food items provide better nutrition if cooked rather than eaten raw. For example, raw berries restore just over 9 hunger raw, but 12 and a half hunger and 1 health when cooked. Meats need to be cooked before eaten, as raw meat will drain your sanity 10 points. Though fish can be eaten raw with no change in nutrition, because sushi? Second, manage the freshness of your food. Food items spoil over time and eventually turn into rot. Fresh foods with a green background have full nutrition, but stale foods with a yellow background have decreased nutrition and lose any sanity benefits. Spoiled foods with a red background should generally not be eaten, as hunger restoration is halved, they don't heal, and you'll lose 10 sanity. But do note that cooking a food item will cut the degree of spoilage in half, a fact that can be used to your advantage. Carrots, berries, and seeds spoil faster after they've been cooked, so carry them raw and only cook them right before eating. A spoiled raw berry's red background will turn green after cooking and can be eaten safely with full nutrition. Meats and fish, on the other hand, spoil faster if left raw, so go ahead and cook them sooner rather than later to maximize the duration of their freshness. Just remember for later that cooked meats cannot be placed on drying racks. And finally, here are some of your best early food options. Carrots and berries are plentiful in grasslands and can be picked up liberally. Seeds are left on the ground by birds and can be found basically everywhere. Meats on the other hand are harder to come by early on as most require either combat or traps, and when you're just starting a new world you want to stay on the move and don't want to get into fights, so going for meat usually isn't the best option. One surprising source of great early game food though is butterflies. Able to be gathered with your bare hands, butterflies spawn from flowers and when killed drop butterfly wings that can be eaten raw for just over 9 hunger while also boasting health restoration of 8 points. Definitely keep that in mind if you get hurt. They also rarely drop butter, which heals an amazing 40 points, fills 25 hunger, and has a shelf life of 40 days. Even better, butter can be used in the crockpot to make a tasty plate of waffles. 
Getting close enough to actually hit butterflies takes some practice, but if you focus on getting close to their shadow and then hitting Control F, you'll be able to stock up on butterfly wings in no time. If you manage to pick up any monster meat, it should not be eaten in either its raw or cooked forms. Although it can later be incorporated into crockpot recipes, eating it raw or cooked will drop your health and sanity. Also, don't worry about picking any mushrooms, although a cooked green mushroom is good at restoring sanity if yours starts to get low. Just don't eat the raw green mushrooms, they're psychoactive and you'll be seeing things in no time. Speaking of sanity, it usually isn't too much of a problem for your first week or two, as you'll have lots of items you'll be prototyping at your science stations as you get established. Each time you prototype a new item or structure, you'll restore 15 points of sanity. If, despite this, your sanity is running low, simply start picking flowers for 5 sanity each, and once you have 12 petals, you can make a garland for additional passive sanity gain. Now that we're all done talking about our elements of Be Prepare, the last major topic we want to cover before ending the video is the specifics of early game exploration to help you find a place to call home. But don't just go wandering aimlessly with no idea of what to look for, rather there are a couple of key objectives you'll want to accomplish, namely locating the various biomes, finding gold and other materials needed for base building, locating beefalo, and identifying a good spot for a long-term base. Let's take these one at a time. Once you've gathered a decent volume of critical survival materials on food, it's time to set off exploring the map to locate the various biomes and contours of your world. The best way to do so is simply tracing the outline of each biome by hugging the coastal edges and following the contrast line between biomes. The way worlds are generated, many biomes will be peninsulas surrounded by ocean on most sides, with connected biomes running through the middle. But since you never know for sure which are connected and which are peninsulas, go ahead and explore them all, though caution is needed for a few of them. Specifically, you'll want to stay out of the swamp unless you're wearing armor of some sort. There are lots of aggressive monsters that call the swamp home, and the tentacles hiding beneath the surface can quickly kill you if you aren't wearing armor. That said, if you have armor, it can be a good idea to gather at least 8 reeds so you can make a birdcage once you start building a base. Another zone to be cautious in is the desert. Usually quite large and containing hound spawning hound mounds, there probably isn't anything in the desert you'll need right now, so feel free to save it for later. But if you do explore it and come across any hound mounds, just keep running. Unlike hounds that come from periodic attacks, these hounds like to stay close to home and will run back to their mounds once you get far enough away. Locating the different biomes early on will be helpful for the rest of fall as you work towards building a base and preparing for winter. But don't feel like you have to go everywhere and explore everything before setting down some roots. If you find what you need early on, go ahead and start a base and finish your map exploration later. Which brings us to our second objective, finding base building materials. Gold in particular is needed for your crafting stations, which unlock all the other structures you'll need in your base. So where do you find gold? Well, there's a couple of options. Gold vein boulders are randomly scattered throughout the world in most biomes, but are particularly common in rocky lands and mosaic biomes, which also have lots of flint and rocks on the ground. Sometimes gold nuggets can be found lying on the ground in forest graveyards, and occasionally rocky lands will have spider infestations that also come with gold nuggets lying on the ground. It's a good idea to gather a full stack of 20 gold as soon as possible. Other than gold, you'll want to gather a full stack of 40 stone and at least 8 reeds if you've been in the swamp. Save your pine cones from chopping trees, as once you start a base, you'll want to plant rows of trees for ongoing wood needs. Early on, it's usually not a good idea, though, to get more than one stack of any given item, as your carrying capacity is limited. As for beefalo, they are an extremely valuable resource to locate, and you'll most likely want to give yourself a home close to where the beefalo roam. For starters, they are prolific poopers, and their manure is an excellent source of fuel, is used for making farms, and can fertilize crops and transplanted grassy tufts and berry bushes. They can be shaved for their wool, which is a crafting material for several winter clothing items, and if killed, they drop 4 meat, 3 wool, and a chance to drop a beefalo horn, which is used to make one of the warmest hats in the game. But more importantly, they are an excellent source of defense against hounds, particularly as the game progresses and the hound attacks get bigger and bigger. Unless it's mating season, when beefalo attack everything on sight, including you, beefalo aren't normally aggressive toward anything, including hounds. But if you run in circles around a herd of beefalo while hounds are chasing you, eventually the hounds will get distracted and bite a beefalo. When that happens, the whole herd will charge the offending hound and make short work of it. Beefalo are only ever found in or on the edge of a savanna, and for this reason, when you find a savanna, it's a good idea to explore it fully to see if it has beefalo. 
If it does, it's not a bad idea to mark the location of the herd by placing a trap on the ground or building a sign there, which will thereafter show up on your minimap. And last but not least, here's some general ideas of what to look for when selecting a good spot to build your base. While there's no hard and fast rules, and certainly a lot of personal preference involved, if you follow these principles your life will be much easier when you're first learning the game. First, Hound Defense. As noted earlier, having your base somewhat close to beefalo is a great option for hound defense. Just don't be too close though, as beefalo periodically get grumpy butts and will attack you on sight unless you're wearing a beefalo hat. Typically about 4-5 to five screens away is a good rule of thumb. Second, not coastal. Pengals randomly spawn in the winter if you're by the ocean, and you don't want them setting up camp in the middle of your base. You can minimize this risk by not having your base too close to the ocean. And finally, food supply. You'll need easy access to food throughout the game, and some of the best options for buy your base are 3-5 to five rabbit holes, a couple of mole worm burrows, or even one or more frog ponds. However, you don't want to be too close to frog ponds, as the frogs are aggressive. They can, however, be caught with traps, and the ponds themselves can be fished. Most other food sources, such as berry bushes and pig houses, can be transplanted or constructed later. Once you've found a good spot, go ahead and stake your claim by constructing a fire pit. The rest of fall, you'll work on fleshing out your base, exploring the map, and preparing for winter, but all that and more will be topics for future videos. Well, that's all for today's episode. I hope you found this video informative, helpful, or at the very least somewhat entertaining. This video is actually my very first ever attempt at making a video for YouTube, so I would greatly appreciate it if you could hit that like button, and be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for future videos as they are released. My next video will probably be either an early game tips and tricks video or how to set up your first base, and after that, I'll cover preparing for winter, how to stay well fed, combat, and a whole slew of other topics. Also, feel free to leave comments below. I would love any feedback, suggestions, or even words of encouragement you might have. So, thanks for watching, and now get out there and don't starve! <laughs>